Thanks very much, Eddie. It's quite a privilege to be introduced by one's offspring, so it's uh, pretty <laughs> exciting for me too. Um, so Eddie and I thought that I should talk to you really about clinical science, because that's what I do. And in some ways, it's an undervalued gig, I think. I think that people don't realise how much you have to be a clinician to do clinical science. And it took me 21 years from completing medical school to handing in my PhD. I gave birth to two boys, as you can see. One turned out pretty well, and so did the other. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, but anyway, really taking you now with your clinical skills that you're getting uh, and showing you how you can take what we do as clinicians, clinical observation, and taking that further, drill deeper, and make a difference. So what we do, and we all do this now as clinicians, is sit, sit in a clinic, see a patient, and that is many of us are doctors here or medical students, but there are also allied health professionals. You also do this. You see the patients in the clinic, and you say, what's special about this patient that they're telling me that is different, that is telling me about the biology. And you'll hear in the vignettes I'm going to share with you that we look towards etiology, but then one needs to take it further, and one can't do that alone. One needs a great team, and I'm really, fa really fortunate to work with a fabulous team of physiologists and basic scientists, as well as imaging people, psychologists, all sorts of um, specialists that help me to drill down and understand the mechanisms of what's going on for my patients. But then it's back to us again, because we have to translate that back to our patients. Partly education, as Ian was talking about, and communication about science. But very excitingly, and this is going to be in your time, translating the science back to making a difference to the outcomes of their disease. And we've already heard about that with that longevity curve, but, but there's still much to be done. So in my talk, um, we're going to give you two major stories about clinical research. The first was the first gene for epilepsy, but I'm going to take that from when we first found that in 95, fast forward to 2016, and show you how this science, this clinical science, married with molecular science, is now helping us to get to precision medicine. I'm then going to speak about the vaccination story. I'm sure a few people in the room will have heard that, but it was a very important observation that Sam and I made about how vaccination wasn't causing disease. And this is still a huge problem in our society, as shown in our recent election. And I think Ian did the, the story about why become a clinician scientist superbly. I have just a couple of slides at the end that are touching on some of the same themes. But I think all the speakers today will give you those themes. So just pick them out of what they're saying about answering important questions and those sorts of issues. So Epilepsy 101, I hope everyone in the room knows this, but 4% of the population has epilepsy at some time in their lives. And if you add in febrile convulsions, also known as febrile seizures, that's in 3% of Australian children. And seizures are due to abnormal electrical activity in the brain, and we pick this up on the EEG. There are many, many types of seizures, and most of epilepsy begins in childhood or adolescence, which is uh, why it's so important in child neurology. And when I see a patient, I try to diagnose them according to a specific epilepsy syndrome. And that is one of the reason I've, reasons I've uh, been so involved with epilepsy classification, because that is around uh, syndromology. So the epilepsies are broadly broken down into two major groups, the generalised epilepsies, which uh, come from bilateral involvement of corticothalamic circuits in the brain. And we know that they're genetic, but how do we know that? clinical research, not because we have the genes for most of the patients. And here you see identical triplets that all have juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So that tells you very clearly it's a genetic disease. The second major group are the focal epilepsies. And the focal epilepsies, of course, are where the seizures begin in one part of the brain. And these were always considered acquired diseases. And when we talk acquired, we're talking about people thought always a structural abnormality of the brain such as the one shown here, hippocampal sclerosis, where you have scarring of the mesial part of a temporal lobe. And that's the com most common finding in uncontrolled temporal lobe ep epilepsy. So that was the point at which I entered this area in my PhD studies. When people just didn't think epilepsy was very genetic, and focal epilepsy is 60% of epilepsy, 
So it starts really uh, with the disorder that this man has. And here you're going to see two different seizures in a 40-year-old man. And what I want you to observe is just how highly stereotyped they are. They come from sleep. He does this about eight times a night. Uh, and he's now, uh, that was when he was young. We recorded one night uh, in, when he was 12 years old at the Children's Hospital, 72 seizures overnight. Um, but he was not aware of all of them. So this guy that does this about eight times a night, and now about once a week this occurs. And this disorder that uh, came out of my PhD is called autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. And it typically begins in uh, mid-childhood at around eight years and is um, characterised by clusters of nocturnal motor events the patient may wake up and have an aura, which you'll miss if you don't ask them about it. And then they have events that can involve tonic stiffening. And the stiffening can be so severe that they can grasp onto their metal bedhead and bend it with the tonic contraction. Or they can have hyperkinetic attacks, such as the little girl I'll show you in a moment. The EEG is not very helpful. And because people have retained awareness often, they were misdiagnosed. Some thought this was, were even diagnosed with hysteria because they thought they were putting them on. Now, we've got lots of PhD students in the audience, and if you do clinical research, you also have those assays that don't work. And you only get to see, hear about the ones that do. Uh, and so this is one that does. We started with two families, and one year of my life later, as a PhD student, we have this pedigree, 27 affected individuals over six generations. And it was with this pedigree that my molecular colleague, John Mully and Ortrud Steinlein, could map it to chromosome 20. In those days, that took a year to map, map a family, and then to find the first epilepsy gene. Now, to everyone's surprise, it was a nicotinic receptor, and the mutation was right here at the iron channel gate. And this was the first evidence that epilepsy was due to iron channels and, and opened the door, really, for it to be, decide, um, to be thought of as a channelopathy. And you're now well aware that there are cardiac channelopathies and many other sorts of channelopathies. So that's way back when, in 1995. If we fast forward to 2016, this can't have gone unnoticed. The Precision Medicine Initiative of uh, Obama and really it's taking uh, this approach is, is worldwide. And this is based on finding a gene mutation and targeting that mutation and developing a therapy for a patient. So this is the same disease, but in a little four-year-old girl, but from a family that when we studied them from a clinical research perspective, we said this is much more severe. This family has very severe psychiatric disorders with uh, aggression and psychosis and intellectual disability. And in, indeed, this little girl was four here. She's now 16, and she's shown marked developmental regression, becoming nonverbal and stopping walking. So the same seizures, the same inheritance pattern, but a much more severe phenotype. So with our molecular colleagues, Sarah Heron in, in Adelaide, we performed exome sequencing in this girl's family. And she found a missense mutation in a sodium-gated potassium channel called KCNT1. And um, this same gene was found in the same edition of Nature Genetics, a French group implicated the same gene with de novo mutations in a profound epilepsy of infancy called migrating focal seizures of infancy. Interestingly, both groups then went on to show that the mutations cause gain of function. So you can see here the wild type or normal, and different mutations shown in blue in the uh, autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy show a marked gain of function. Now, my colleague Steve Petru, uh, who's a physiologist, together with Carol Milligan in his lab at the Flory, looked at this because Steve recognised the quinidine, which is related to quinine that you have in your gin and tonic every night. So quinidine actually works directly on this channel. And in their in vitro studies, they showed beautifully that it reversed the gain of function. So we've gone from clinical phenotype leading to discovery of a gene, leading to, under leading to understanding mechanism, and now a potential treatment. So what does it do? Well, we're at early stages at this, but this is one very clear example. 
And in this migrating focal seizure phenotype, that's the profound epileptic encephalopathy, one group reported a child here, a girl of 25 months, who in vitro, the quinidine shows reversal of the gain of function, and in vivo, in the little girl, her seizures improved and she made small developmental gains. And then we were uh, fortunate to collaborate with a group from Duke who looked at two patients, one with a, a picture very similar to the girl I showed you, focal epilepsy and regression, some benefit in vitro, um, but no benefit in vivo. Yet in their se uh, second case, who had this very severe migrating focal seizure phenotype, they show some benefit, but not as much interestingly as this one in vitro, but 80% seizure reduction. So this is what precision medicine means. It means really using your biology to develop a targeted therapy. But we've got to get the outcomes right. And so this is a beginning, but we're, no, we're by no means there. We need normal development and we need no seizures. And that's also a huge area for you to follow. So let's move on then to the severe infantile epilepsies. And there are many of those. But one that I've done um, much work in it, and also one that is extremely well known is called Dravet syndrome. And we also already heard from Ian about how you can put in a piece of a puzzle, and that can be incredibly important. And I like to use a puzzle to talk about this because these are very complex phenotypes, and you have to put together all the pieces of the puzzle. One bit doesn't make it the syndrome. So Dravet syndrome is where a child starts off completely normal, uh, and then at six months um, of age, we've got a... Pro oh, I know, I'm pressing the wrong thing. There you go. Six months of age, a normal baby presents with um, an episode of status epilepticus, so a prolonged seizure, um, and that can involve jerking down one side or be on both sides. They then go on to develop additional seizure types, and here you see the photic stimulator uh, flashing for that patient and triggering a cluster of myoclonic seizures. And you'll see, uh, and if we had the volume on, which I'm sparing you, you'd hear he doesn't like it very much, but he's not going into a tonic-clonic seizure. So in Dravet syndrome, these children go on to develop other seizure types, focal seizures, absence, and often episodes of non-convulsive status where they're just not with it for several days at a time or hours. Development's normal in the first year of life, absolutely normal, and then they slow and regress, and almost all have intellectual disability. They walk just a little late at 18 months, and we've shown in our older study, our studies of older patients with uh, orthopaedic surgeons and postdoctoral physiotherapists, that they develop this very um, debilitating crouch gait. And so that's also something we need to think about how we can make that, uh, that improve. The EEG is normal, despite having lots of seizures in the first two years of life, but then it becomes quite abnormal with generalised and multifocal epileptiform activity. And finally, the genes. Uh, the gene here is known in most of the patients, and in more than 80%, they have mutations of the sodium channel alpha-1 subunit, and here you see the sodium channel embedded in the cell membrane. Here's the alpha-1 uh, pore-forming subunit, and more than 80% of patients have mutations in this subunit. So by discovering this very complex phenotype, with, which Charlotte Dravet did, uh, then people could go and look at the sodium channels, which first came to light because of work in febrile seizures and our finding of sodium channels in a milder febrile seizure phenotype. People then said, hey, febrile seizures are key to Dravet syndrome. And so uh, they looked at that and we now know that most of these patients are solved from a molecular point of view. So that's Dravet syndrome. And that's by way of background to the discussion about whooping cough uh, vaccine and so-called vaccine encephalopathy. Now, this is from the London Times. It's not that long ago, 1993. And there, the victim of the whooping cough vaccine won a huge payout in those days for what that vaccine allegedly did to the child's brain. So what is vaccine encephalopathy? It's a sudden development of encephalopathy with seizures and developmental regression in a previously normal infant. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And there's long been a claim of a causal link between the pertussis or whooping cough uh, component of the triple antigen vaccination that has public health consequences, of course, with vaccine uptake and medico-legal implications. 
And despite this strong um, sense that maybe they're causing it, there are large scale epidemiological studies that do not show that this is a true association. But if you're a parent and your child starts to seize within 48 hours of vaccination, it's very hard to convince you that it's not the vaccine that did it. So in our study, we were studying these severe epilepsies of infancy uh, and childhood called the epileptic encephalopathies. And in those, we had a nested study of 14 cases which had alleged vaccine encephalopathy. Now, the eldest was 47 years old, so we went back and got their early history. And of course, you can try and get the hospital records and you can ask the mothers who've, and fathers, but usually the mothers in those days that would have lived uh, through every seizure more closely. Uh, and we found that of those 14, 12 had a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, 13 were associated with onset of triple antigen vaccine, and 11 had SCM1A mutations. So we showed that these individuals actually had a genetic cause rather than an immune response to the vaccine. And at the most, vaccines uh, triggered a genetically determined disease. Now, the families had got their large payouts in the UK because they'd alleged that they had no family history of seizures, therefore it must have been the vaccine that did it. But the research showed us it was a de novo mutation and therefore that's why there was no family history. And this obviously has societal and medico-legal consequences. We then took this uh, another step and we looked at our cases with Dravet syndrome and an STM1A mutation. And we got the documents of the timing of, the, of their vaccination um, and the hospital documents for their first presentation. So we were eliminating recall bias, which of course is very important. And we examined the time between the timing of vaccination and seizure onset. So here's one of those source documents. Many of you will have a baby book just like this. This is Sam's son's baby book. And you can see here the beautifully stamped dates of their vaccine. You can see vaccination was very good for Sam's son. He's six foot six and having a lovely uh, wedding day here in 2007. And so what did we find? Well, we had 37 cases with SCM1A mutations and validated dates. And we had 24 that were vaccine distant. So vaccine, their onset was not related to vaccination. And 13 that were vaccine prominent, uh, proximate. And you can see here that within two days of vaccination, you can see a very clear peak. Um, and that we then went on and examined those cases and said, are they any different clinically from the cases that were not vaccine related? And what we found is that they were exactly the same. They just started seven weeks earlier. Um, and of course, this leads to great fear for these families. What about the next vaccination? And so now we arrange for families to have vaccinations in the vaccination clinic at the children's. And indeed, a two-year-old I saw a couple of weeks ago was in the children's for 24 hours and at 22 hours went into status. So it seems to be a very appropriate thing to do. Um, we also um, uh, talk about pre-medication with paracetamol. I don't think we know that that makes a difference. But the important issue here is that those children were destined to have Dravet syndrome. And if it wasn't vaccination at that time, the next stress, be it a fever or an illness, may have triggered it. So there's an example of how vaccine encephalopathy, we went on to find the cause, an SCN1A mutation. Um, and then our colleagues, uh, our basic science colleagues, have developed animal models showing very clearly that it's the inhibitory interneurons that are not working. And we have a very important role in dispelling the belief that the vaccine is causative. I don't think we've quite succeeded with that in our whole community, but you as medical professionals will have that important role. And if you haven't see, seen this, I would certainly recommend you watch it. You can download it from SBS. It's a beautiful movie documentary uh, called Jabbed, and it's done by Sonia Pemberton, who's an Emmy Award winning movie director. And she has um, showcased six different anti-vaccination anti stories here. And it's great watching to understand how all this vaccination debate has come about. So in my last uh, few minutes, I just want to touch briefly on why be a clinician scientist and, and really echo some of the many messages that Ian shared. 
Um, and some people would say, well, that's not what I signed up for. I wanted to be a medical a doctor and I wanted to see patients and why would I bother? That's going to be exciting enough for me. It's certainly what I thought as a medical student, um, having had no exposure to this world. Um, I would put it to you, it makes my life and my work far more interesting. I have three careers all the time, often in a day, and by that I'll have a very busy clinic or an inpatient who's extremely complicated. I'll then go and teach and then I'll write a paper with a member of my team, which is also great fun. But remember, clinical research is not basic science and it's something you need a lot of skills to do and it takes a long time to get there. So one of the messages is enjoy the journey. Don't worry too much about the end point, but enjoy each stage for what it is. Life is rich. We are extremely fortunate to have a career that is so exciting. Why bother? Well, it gives you a different way of looking at the world and it helps you to make a difference far beyond the patients that you see uh, with a global impact, changing practice and changing outcomes. And I get to see that all the time and I think it's, it's really exciting. One of the things I think is worth remembering is that moment of discovery, that excitement when you realise you are the first person in the world to put two and two together and that this can make a difference. And we can all do that, everyone in this room, but you have to get the right questions and the right time. So is it part of your day job? Well, as I said, you have to be a clinician to do clinical research. So 21 years it took me to submit my PhD and everything. I just wish someone had told me to stop worrying about the endpoint as much. So that's why I'm sharing that with you. Uh, and remember that every patient you see raises a new research question and can tell you something about the science. But you need to make sure you pick the questions worth answering. So are you trained for it? You finished med school, are you a junior doctor now or a fellow? You know, do you already need, know it all? Well, I would put it to you that the most you've got at the moment is a taste for research. You might have done one or two papers, a case series or something, but that's not real research. If you're really going to be a researcher, you have to do high level training, and that is a PhD. It is a new career. You're not meant to know how to do it. That's what you're there for. Um, and the most important thing is to choose a good mentor. And so I always tell my students, I expect every paper to have 20 drafts. My own often have 50. It is hard work, but you know, you can read them many years later and they still read well and give the message. So it takes time and dedication. But I think everyone here today is going to show you that it's very rewarding. It's not often you have glamour, as Ian shared with you, and I'm going to show for the women because you're worth it, and that's a L'Oreal catchphrase. But it just shows you this was my moment of very French glamour. Um, and also, um, I'm very fortunate to uh, have received the Prime Minister's Prize for Science with my colleague, Sam Berkovic. Can't always pick your Prime Minister, but that's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd like to finish by just showing you our fantastic team. None of this work can happen in isolation. Uh, this is one of our, we've had now 21 research retreats for epilepsy. We had our autism retreat yesterday. And we are just so privileged to work with bright young scientists, even bright old scientists that can help us to take it further forward. So thank you very much.